Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Good evening and happy Labor Day. Look at across the city right now and say that everybody out there grilling may have had burgers, hot dogs with a side of rain. How about that? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> a lot of people out there and across a good portion of San Antonio and even surrounding communities and areas surrounding Bear County. A lot of activity out there this afternoon. It's scattered in nature. Not everyone's getting it, but we're seeing more development south of town as we these outflow boundaries start to come together. Now, what I want to focus on is where we've had most of the rain, and that has been the far northwest and west side of San Antonio. Bernie to Leon Springs to UTSA, all the way around to about Alamo Ranch, and that is starting to dissipate. So that's coming to an end, which is good, because otherwise we'd be dealing with a few flooding uh, situations. But luckily that's dissipating. Now we have new development downtown, and even from the airport to downtown, Alamo Heights, Terrell Hills, Monta Vista points eastward toward China Grove, Lone Oak, Atkins. This is all because of this outflow boundary that just moved in. And these outflow boundaries are coming together, colliding, and boom, kickstarting new showers and storms. I anticipate more development toward Lavernia and uh, even toward Stockdale area. But that's where we're seeing the newest development is now south of San Antonio and south of Highway 90, even around Uvalde and points southward. What we have lingering out there will last through about sunset. Some of it will not all of it will some of it's raining itself out but where we have the heaviest rain one to two inches of rainfall easily we'll take a look at radar estimates coming up in a bit and we'll talk about more rainfall in the forecast and the benchmark we hit today coming up sam all right adam thanks very much a man was left dying on the side of a busy street this morning after a shooting on the west side now it happened in the 2300 block of calabra road close to the intersection with bandera police at the scene this morning told reporters that witnesses had said there was a fight and somebody pulled up in a vehicle fired multiple shots and fled did uh, the victim have any weapons either was her firing back uh we didn't find any uh, so no, not at this time. Here, responding officers found an unconscious man with four gunshot wounds at the scene, and he died there. About a block away, there is a father and a son getting back into the getting back into the back of an SAPD patrol unit. You can see it there. A family member told us her brother, who says who she says has mental issues, lives at the Calaber location and sits out front. Now, as of our last check with the medical examiner's office, the shooting victim had not yet been identified. And a man is in police custody this evening after jealousy got the best of him. SAPD says he threatened to kill the mother of his child. According to an affidavit, 20-year-old Aaron Jacob Garcia went to his girlfriend's home on Gardner Street near Casterville Road and Highway 151 back on August 28th. Police say as the woman was getting ready for bed, Garcia opened her window from outside and pointed a gun into the bedroom, asking if a man was with her. Then he threatened to kill her if he ever caught her with another man. Officers say he then shot one round outside, closed the window, and broke it with his fist. Garcia is now charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. San Antonio police are investigating a crash that sent four people to the hospital. Police say a person driving a red car veered off the road and hit a truck with three people inside. The crash happened just after 10 last night in the 2000 block of East Houston Street near downtown. SAPD says the impact caused the gas tank of the pickup truck to rupture. The people inside the truck were taken to the hospital but are expected to be okay. The driver of the red car was taken to Bamsey in serious condition. Police are still investigating investigating whether that driver was intoxicated or not. A stolen vehicle is found in flames and a San Antonio police officer is blown back after it explodes. This happened just after one this morning over the 1700 block of Larkspur Drive, not far from West Avenue in Lock Hill, Selma. Stephen Cavasso shows us the destruction and the questions now left behind. A San Antonio police officer is blown back 10 feet after a fire consumed this vehicle. According to SAPD, the officer attempted to extinguish the flames, but the vehicle exploded as he approached. This happened on the city's north side early Monday morning. The vehicle, which was reported stolen, was left at the intersection of Larkspur and Baltic Drive. Nearby residents spotted the flames and contacted authorities. Crews with the San Antonio Fire Department were able to get the scene under control, but the flames left the vehicle destroyed. Two air conditioners were found inside, which police believe may have been stolen. Suspects were also spotted leaving the area, but no description has been provided. The police officer that was blown back was checked out at the scene and thankfully is expected to be okay. The investigation is ongoing. Stephen Cavasso's KSAP. 12 News. 
Almost a year ago, San Antonio nurse practitioner Justin Vine was released from the hospital after testing positive for COVID-19. Vine was in a medically induced coma for 56 days and says he has been working daily to get back to his normal life. Tiffany Huerta spoke with Justin about his journey and his message to those who haven't yet been vaccinated. I never thought I would be where I'm at today or I'd be able to get back to this spot. At that time, it was, it was um, a big mountain in the climb. Last year, Justin Vine spent weeks on a ventilator and was in a two month coma following his COVID-19 diagnosis. But looking uh, back at that, so something I would never wanna have to go through again. On June 30th, Justin was hospitalized. He was given a plasma donation and remdesivir. After getting better, he was released from the hospital on October 2nd. Today, Justin says he is doing physical therapy exercises at home and sees different specialists. We've been working on the walking and everything, and a lot of times I can walk without a cane. Justin has also returned to work as a pediatric nurse practitioner and says they've been extremely busy during this current COVID surge. There's been 30, 40 plus people in the door and there were a smaller clinic um, that we, and we accommodate as best we can, as many as we can. And uh, but the uh, the need and the call for uh, for assistance for the RSV and COVID have been uh, like astronomical. Lately. Although young children can't get vaccinated just yet, Justin encourages those who can to get it. Earlier this year, Justin and his family got the vaccine. And I did have like up to 24 to 30, uh, 36 hours of, you know, some uh, uh, like dizziness or a little bit of a headache, but they all passed and it went pretty good after that. Justin says he is thankful to be back home and surrounded with those he loves. Enjoying being home with the family and watching uh, the kids grow. And Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. The school district outside of San Marcos is now requiring face masks for all students, teachers, and visitors following an outbreak in the district. Lockhart ISD officials say almost 800 students are currently in quarantine due to COVID exposure. As of Saturday, there were more than 200 active cases. 181 of those are students. The LISD Board of Trustees voted 5-2 to two on Saturday to require face coverings in all school buildings and on buses. Now to the holiday weekend. As Labor Day comes to a close, health officials have new concerns about the pandemic. Crowding at airports, stadiums, beaches during the highest hospitalization surges our country has seen in months. ABC's Morgan Norwood has the latest from Los Angeles. As the Delta variant clutches the country, straining hospitals and driving up cases, a Labor Day weekend reminiscent of times pre-pandemic. The CDC director had warned unvaccinated people shouldn't travel over the holiday, yet more than three and a half million people were screened at U.S. airports between Friday and Saturday. That's roughly the same number of Labor Day weekend travelers as 2019 before the pandemic began. I am expecting a bump. I'm hoping we're not going to see a major spike. But after every single holiday, we have seen a bump in infections and hospitalizations and deaths. That bump could stretch struggling hospitals beyond their limits. The U.S. already averaging nearly 150,000 infections per day and more than 1,100 deaths each day, mostly among the unvaccinated. Nobody's masked and people are like, yeah, it's all open. It's all free. And it's devastating to me. With all 50 states now seeing high community spread, some schools are being forced to temporarily shut down classrooms. In Texas, ABC station KTRK reporting at least 45 school districts with more than 40,000 students have paused in-person learning due to the climb in cases. I think Delta variant being more contagious than previous you know, variants of the coronavirus is just a, kind of a game changer for pediatrics. What's driving it is that the adults around them are not vaccinated and they're getting infected. So we're seeing a rise in kids in places with large infection rates among adults. If we want to protect kids, adults around them should be getting vaccinated. I think we can get kids back to school safely. We're going to have to monitor that schools don't drive more infections. Uh, but I do think what we re really need to do is make sure that the adults in their lives uh, all have the shot. And speaking of those shots, plans for boosters are moving forward. Dr. Fauci telling CNN that Pfizer's boosters will be ready by that September 20th rollout from the Biden administration. On the other hand, Moderna shots could be delayed. Morgan Norwood, ABC News, Los Angeles. 
Have you seen this dog? It's one of many wandering around South Bear County near Loop 1604 and Pleasanton Road. The thing is, Jack isn't just another stray. He was among the nearly 30 stray dogs that Richard Ewers had taken in before he died of cancer. Thanks to a team of dedicated volunteers, they were turned over to animal rescue groups that found homes for all of them except for Jack. He's the one who got away. Luckily, he was spotted today by Mary Euler, who has spent the last two years looking for him. Yet, just yesterday, she'd finally caught him until someone who she says must have been watching her pulled up in an SUV blocking her vision. By the time she got off the phone arranging a transport, the cage had been opened. Tampering with the trap should be a crime, whether it be a city trap, a county trap, uh, a rescue trap, rescue volunteer, leave it alone. Do not touch it. Okay. That from a veteran volunteer devoted to rescuing other animals like Jack, Euler says that she promised the man that she knew as Mr. Richard they'd find homes for all of his dogs, so she intends to keep that promise. If you see Jack in the area of Loop 1604 and Pleasanton Road, you can contact her or Save Our Strays San Antonio. They're both on Facebook. Now to an update on a lost scrapbook we told you about earlier this summer. It belonged to a cardiologist in New York, but somehow turned up at an estate sale here in San Antonio. Now after they heard about the story, the family of the late Dr. Leon Goldberg contacted Lisa Jackson, the public relations executive who happened to buy the scrapbook. Jesse Degollado says even so, the mystery is far from over. The discovery of a treasured scrapbook of memories came out of nowhere for Dr. Leon Goldberg's niece, Susan Alpert. What was your reaction when you heard that the scrapbook even existed? I was completely astonished. How did it get there? From, from Nyack, New York to San Antonio, Texas, 60 years later. Which is exactly why Lisa Jackson brought us the scrapbook, hoping someone would recognize it on the air. New at six, a dust covered scrapbook still had a little glimmer to it. I, did, I didn't think it was ever gonna happen. But it did, thanks to social media and the internet. <laughs> I was so excited, I was so excited. Still, the question is, how did the scrapbook wind up behind an east side restaurant at an estate sale along with a random assortment of other items? Soon after the story aired, someone contacted Jackson on Facebook, saying his great aunt owned the funeral home that was once there. They say perhaps the scrapbook was among what the great aunt had left behind, being that her funeral home may have handled her arrangements. If so... I don't know how it got into her possession. I still want to know that. Further adding to the mystery, it's believed the viewer's great aunt at one time may have been Dr. Goldberg's housekeeper. Once it's returned, Dr. Goldberg's meticulously kept scrapbook may hold an entirely new chapter in their family history. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for opening this to all of us. I thank you. You guys have brought me into your family and I've learned a whole lot. Jesse DeGoyetto, KSAT 12 News. A great story. Such a great story there. Thanks, Jesse. And Jackson says she intends to personally return the scrapbook to Dr. Goldberg's family as soon as possible. On our website right now, we have more about Dr. Goldberg and the theories Jackson and his niece have about his possible ties to San Antonio. Around Texas now, the U.S. Attorney General pledging to protect abortion clinics in the state. Attorney General Merrick Garland said Monday in a statement the Justice Department will enforce the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, also known as the FACE Act. His statement comes in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision to allow the state's six-week abortion ban to go into effect. Garland says the DOJ is exploring legal avenues for challenging the state law. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break. All right, so a quick traffic update. This is a 281 in Hildebrand. Looked like a car is facing the wrong direction. This is the southbound lanes of 281 as you see the traffic flowing there, but you see the car facing the wrong direction. You have these issues when you have rain like this, slick roads. 
And that's uh, the apparent, w apparently what has happened there. There were some more emergency vehicles there a short time ago. Those have been uh, cleared out. Also seeing some reports of some high water on Loop 1604 out west. Not surprising, a military Loop 1604, also Wiseman in Loop 1604 earlier. So definitely some impacts on the roads from the weather we saw that is moving through the area right now and some of the rain, the heavy rain on the west side we saw earlier too. Yeah, that rain is definitely impacting our Labor Day plans. We have a lot of people pausing their grilling going on right now. Yeah, you could say that, right? And we're starting to see more development elsewhere in San Antonio. So it started off mainly the north side, the far northwest and west side. Now we're seeing it develop elsewhere. We have these outflow boundaries that are getting kicked out and they collide and generate new showers and storms. Today, we did make a new benchmark. Before we jump into the showers, I want to point out it is our latest first 100 degree day on record of the years we've hit 100 mm. 23 we didn't but 2021 marks the latest that we hit 100 in the calendar year all right scattered storms right now they'll be ending later on this evening a drop in the humidity is actually coming that's just around the corner okay let's get right to it taking a look at our radar and you look at the activity over the past hour and you see it really turn into more light rain that green color than the heavy showers and thunderstorms which are indicated by particularly the red color on the radar so a lot of that's dissipating and starting to fall apart and just turn into lighter rain but that said we also have new development farther south of san antonio so that activity that we had on the far west and northwest side of town that's pretty much done i was looking at rain gauge reports of over an inch and even over two inches on the south side of Bernie at the Cibolo Creek there. I believe that's at the Nature Center and that had a measured over two inches of rainfall. But now the development 281 and 410 up and down 281 to downtown. We're talking I-35 east side of town. Same with 410 all the way to Live Oak, China Grove, Atkins, St. Hedwig. This will be similar to what we had on the west side of town where it persists for about an hour and then it slowly rains itself out. It just doesn't move very much. That's the thing. This was all caused by these outflow boundaries. Those green lines you see that get pushed out and pushed around by these thunderstorms is basically these storms exhaling a bit, some cooler air, and it acts as like a mini cool front to develop new thunderstorms. So that's why we're seeing this activity around Floresville, stretching down toward Potita as well. Pleasanton was recently at 98 degrees. Get ready for your temperature to quickly drop down into the low 80s and maybe even 70s as that rain moves in. You look farther west along Highway 90, some scattered activity, lightning and thunder around Hondo as well. Hondo records a gust of over 50 miles per hour earlier today from some thunderstorms. So that's what we have right now. A lot of this will be coming to an end, if not all of it, after sunset later on this evening. Let's talk about rainfall totals. This is just over the past 12 hours with this rain. And look at these values here from Hallettsville to Shiner, almost Gonzales, Seguin, and much of San Antonio, especially along and north of Highway 90, where you see the yellow, that indicates around two inches of rain of rain estimated by the Doppler radar. So for example, right around UTSA here toward Brandeis High School, this yellow, look at this, the uh, Doppler radar is actually indicating about three inches of rain in there, that area right along 1604. So pretty impressive. Now it looks like nighttime out there right now when you look at our camera and we'll take a look at that in a second because of all the rainfall, but uh, the sun sets a little closer to eight o'clock. Stationary boundary overhead, that's one of the reasons why we're getting these showers and storms triggered. Look how dark it is out there. I was, I rebooted the computer to see if it was just the camera, but no, uh, it's just because of the thick clouds and the thunderstorms and the lower sun angle now, 100 for the high temperature today. So far at the airport, we haven't measured anything more than a trace of rain. 76 degrees out there. You see wide ranging temperatures. Pleasanton, I mentioned 98. Get ready for that to drop fast. Canyon Lake, 80. Bernie, 68 right now. Kerrville, 72. You get in the sunshine and we're over 100. Del Rio and Catula now. 103 degrees. So this evening, those lingering showers through about eight o'clock, they'll be coming and going here and there, but pretty much all of them coming to an end after sunset. Then we'll have some partial clearing, not much of a breeze overnight. Tomorrow we'll start the day at 73, make it back up into the upper 90s, right near 100, with a few pop-up showers and storms, but probably not as extensive as what we had today. Near 100 the rest of the week, okay? Right up near the century mark, give or take a few degrees. But here's the key, lower humidity by Wednesday. You'll notice a big drop in the humidity Wednesday afternoon and every afternoon thereafter into Saturday. So we do have a plus side to the heat. Yeah, nevertheless, we've definitely got to stay hydrated with those 
Hot temps right there. Thank you, Adam. Triple digits. Sports is coming up next. Yeah, hey, Greg. Or right now, if you'd like. <laughs> right now. But I'll tell you UTSA, what. Yeah. I think the thing that you're excited about here is the fact that UTSA scored, I would say, their biggest win ever in their short-time football program because they did it on the road and they never lost the lead. When we come back, you'll hear from the UTSA Roadrunners also taking pressure off of the new quarterbacks for both Texas and Texas A&M. The secret coming up. UTSA Roadrunners are coming off arguably their biggest win in school history this weekend after they were able to score their first win ever over a Big Ten team and only their second win ever over a Power Five team when they beat Illinois. And what made it even more remarkable is that they did it on the road and they never trailed. Quarterback Frank Harris got the scoring off with a nine-yard run and right behind him, Brendan Brady with a seven-yard touchdown to jump out to a 14-0 lead. After the final line, I cut that lead to three in the fourth quarter. Harris went to the air to find Zachary Franklin on a 19-yard touchdown toss and later, Brady added his second touchdown on the ground, this time from 33 yards out in the 37 to 30 victory. One to remember for the triangle of toughness. I'm happy for my kids, but one thing I really want to stress is the crowd here was so fantastic tonight. It was so hard in that student section, their band. It was a home field crowd. When we get back next week, the Alamo Dome's got to be rocking. We've got a great, great football team. We've got some great local kids that are good, good humans. And we need that Alamo Dome full so those kids can see how much San Antonio loves their players. It means a lot. I mean, it just shows that, you know, if we buy into the culture, um, that we're capable of doing things like this. And, uh, you know, just going out there every day and practice competing against one another. And I was actually showing now going against opponents in a big time point like this. So it's just a great thing for the program. All right. UTSA's home opener will be this Saturday at five against Lamar in the Alamo Dome. Texas Longhorns kicked off their 2021 season with a 38 to 18 win against the Raging Cajuns of Louisiana with a new head coach and Steve Sarkeesian and a new starting quarterback in Hudson Card. The star of the game was running back Bijan Robinson, who had 176 yards and included 103 on the ground, included catching Card's first touchdown pass as a new Longhorn starting quarterback and a seven yard touchdown run. His performance, which earned him the Walter Camp Football Foundation National Offensive Player of the Week, will go a long ways to taking some of the pressure off of Card, who now has to start his first game on the road in a hostile environment where the Hornets travel to Arkansas to face their longtime rivals. We know it's going to be a hostile environment. Uh, they've got a sold out game, I think, for the first time since 2017. So uh, I think one of the keys for us, obviously, is handling that crowd noise and what we do from a communication standpoint uh, offensively will be big. Kickoff between Texas and Arkansas and Fayetteville will be at 6 p.m. on Saturday, and the Hornets are early six point favorites. The fight in Texas Aggies also won their season opener against Kent State, 41-10, but had to shake off early turnovers by new starting quarterback Haynes King in order to win. King threw three interceptions in his first game as the Aggies' new starting quarterback, replacing San Antonio's Kellen Mond, who was drafted by the Minnesota Vikings, leading by only 10-3 at the first half. The defense would have to step up, and they did. Leon O'Neal, the play of the game, stepping in front of the intended receiver, then returning this interception 85 yards with a touchdown. Like the Horns, the Aggies' running game would help take some of the pressure off of King in the form of Devon A. Chain, who had two touchdowns in the game, including this 63-yarder in the third quarter to blow the game wide open. He would finish with 124 yards. I'm a lot more comfortable because, you know, I, all the reps that I took, you know, it's, it's a lot more, like, memorizing to me than last year. You know, I feel like I'm a lot more comfortable because I've worked, like, on my game off the season. So it's, like, easy for me to transfer, transfer it into the game day. The fight in Texas Aggies hit the road for the first time this season to face Colorado Saturday at 2.30 p.m., where the Aggies are 17-and-a-half point favorites at mile high. And coming up tonight on the night beat, the big game and our big game coverage this Friday night, may surprise you. Oh, can't wait for that. Greg. Battle of the early unbeaten. Oh, we'll look forward to that. Thank you. Night of the night beat. <laughs> Stay with us. Now to the desperate attempts to escape Afghanistan. One group says hundreds of people, including Americans, are set to fly out of the country. But the Taliban is blocking those flights for leaving for days. ABC's Alex Brashay has the latest from Washington. Today, the Taliban claiming victory and total control of Afghanistan. They say they've taken the last rebel stronghold to the north of Kabul. The fighting group there, which calls itself the National Resistance Front, denies the claim. But the Taliban have been posting celebrations on social media, which they say show them in control. 
If true, it's the first time that area, long resistant to Taliban control, has fallen. Elsewhere, resistance continues. A small group of Afghan women protested near the presidential palace in Kabul on Friday, demanding equal rights from the Taliban and meeting a violent response. Meanwhile, the race to evacuate for those still in the country continues. The State Department saying four American citizens safely evacuated from Afghanistan across the land border. The U.S. facilitated the journey, the first of its kind. The Taliban aware of their transit, but did not block them. But at the North Afghanistan airport. Well, it's grim, quite candidly. They were in good spirits when they went up there a, a couple of days ago. But now, like I said, uh, they have had to switch locations because they were in danger. Paul Stern, who works for a U.S.-based charity which focuses on the empowerment of women, is trying to get Afghan girls out of the country. These satellite photos reportedly showing chartered planes waiting to take off, but being blocked by the Taliban. ABC learning that there are Americans in the group, but the State Department would not confirm that, saying, we do not have personnel on the ground. We do not have air assets in the country. The White House now saying there are about 100 Americans still in the country trying to evacuate. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Qatar this evening to thank the country for its role in evacuations. General Mark Milley warned that Afghanistan could soon fall into civil war. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Now to the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. President Joe Biden approved major disaster declarations in New Jersey and New York. New Jersey streets are still lined with debris and the people who live there are devastated by the damage. Their governor now promising people the resources to recover. The scene is similar in New York City where over a dozen lost their lives due to Ida. The death toll now at 68 people across eight states, hundreds of thousands still without power. Some in Louisiana, like Christina Romero, may not have electricity for weeks. I have a three-year-old and she don't understand. We can't come home and she keeps on every day. Mama, I want to go home and it's hard. It really is because she don't understand. Like we can't, like you can't live like that. You know, you can't. President Biden visited Louisiana firsthand last week. He now plans to visit some hard hit areas in New Jersey and in New York tomorrow. Actor Michael Williams, best known for his work on the HBO series The Wire, was found dead in his home today. Police say Williams, who played Omar on the hit show, was discovered by a family member in his Brooklyn apartment. Authorities say drug par paraphernalia was also found around him, making it look like an apparent overdose. Few other details surrounded the actor's death was released. Williams was 54 years old. And across America tonight, a Florida man is being held without bond after deputies say he killed four people, including an infant and the child's mother in Lakeland and Polk County. Officials say 33 year old Brian Riley faces four counts of first degree murder and several other charges. Investigators say Riley is a former Marine sharpshooter who served in Iraq and Afghanistan before being honorably discharged. He had no known connection to his victims, according to deputies. The suspect says he is a survivalist and admits to taking meth. Riley surrendered to deputies after they exchanged fire on the scene. Meanwhile, four people are recovering after a festival shooting in Missouri last night. Authorities in Independence say three of the victims were teenagers. The fourth was a 25-year-old. They were all treated and released this morning. Police say the incident occurred at the Santa Cali Gone Days event. Eyewitnesses say there was some sort of disagreement shortly before gunfire erupted. No arrests have been made. Coming up, Pringles making your hunt for a late night snack much easier. Still ahead, what flavors you can get in these glow in the dark chips and how long they'll be available. Plus, a warning for parents with small children. How can you prevent furniture from falling on top of them? That's next in your health headlines. In health headlines tonight, two-thirds of Americans don't anchor their furniture to prevent it from tipping over, and it's posing a risk to their kids. Now, according to Consumer Reports, a new study shows furniture is most likely falling on children two years old and younger. Mandy Gaither shares what parents need to know in today's Health Minute. 
Falling furniture, it's a hidden danger and may be found throughout your home. It happens very quickly. The child can be trapped underneath. A new study published in Injury Epidemiology shows more than 560,000 children have been treated in the ER from 1990 to 2019 after being hurt by furniture or TVs that have tipped over. 70% of those hurt were younger than six, most of them around two years old. The research shows almost half the injuries were to the head or neck. Dressers and wardrobes account for about 17% of all tip over injuries. These types of furniture are often placed on carpet. The, the drawers are loaded and multiple drawers may be opened at the same time. And that increases the potential for that furniture to tip over on a child. Dr. Gary Smith, the study's senior author, says to help prevent tip overs, parents should secure furniture to the wall using safety straps or L brackets. Mount TVs to the wall when possible. If you can't, put a TV on an appropriate piece of furniture that's designed to hold it and anchor both to the wall. Keep TVs and furniture clear. Placing things on top of them, like a remote control, may encourage children to climb. But Smith says these steps aren't enough. We need manufacturers to step up and make furniture and TVs more stable to begin with. Even when furniture appears sturdy, Smith says looks can be deceiving. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Also making health headlines this evening, a new report shows air pollution is cutting down the life expectancy of billions of people around the world. That's according to the University of Chicago's Energy Policy Institute. Researchers found life expectancy for people in countries with below standard levels of air pollution was slashed by more than two years on average. The top five countries were all in Asia. That's right. The report also says air pollution is a greater threat than smoking. War on diseases like HIV and AIDS. Take a look at live cam. We swear it's not nighttime yet, but it does right. still look like it outside. That is crazy. Right now with the weather that has been moving through the area. Yeah, and look at that. I'm moving the camera, and no matter which direction you look, it, uh, it's, it's just... It's gloomy, man. <laughs> <laughs> looks like nighttime out there. Some of that's caused, uh, and the blur is caused by water on the protective casing around the lens, but it's just dark because of the, the showers and thunderstorms we have out there. So some rain out there right now. We'll see those rain chances falling off the rest of this evening. A lot of the heavy rain has turned into light, good soaking and persistent rain. We'll take a look at how much rain fell over certain aquifer zones. Talk about rain chances tomorrow, a benchmark we hit today and a change in humidity. So much to cover. I'll see you in a few minutes. The late actor Chadwick Boseman will always be remembered at Howard University. The historically black university in Washington, D.C. has renamed its fine arts building after him. On Twitter, Howard University says he left an immeasurable legacy for the next generation. The late Black Panther actor graduated from the school in 2000 with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in directing. He died last year from colon cancer at age 43. Marvel Entertainment owner Walt Disney is also planning to build a new state-of-the-art, pledging to build a new state-of-the-art facility at the school. In addition, the company is planning an endowment in honor of Bozeman. And here's what's happening in the buzz in the entertainment world this evening. The man who embodies Jedi Master Luke Skywalker has found something more powerful than the force on social media his real name. Something that simple, right? A Twitter user challenged Mark Hamill to just post his name saying Hamill could likely get thousands of likes with the simple tweet. Well, get this, the user was right. Since Sunday, Mark Hamill, that tweet there, <laughs> has gotten over 500,000 likes and 31,000 retweets. Is it that mm. easy? The challenge quickly started <laughs> trending on Twitter. <laughs> Star Trek actor George Takai even joined in. The force is with his real name right there. All right, here we go. <laughs> Banksy's famous shredded painting is going on sale again, and it may have increased six times its value. 
Three years ago, a Banksy painting named Girl with the Balloon shocked onlookers after partially shredding itself. This happened just moments after it had been sold for $1.4 million. Now renamed Love is in the Bin. It's going on sale again next month and could fetch $8.3 million. Banksy, a mysterious street artist based in UK, is famously cynical about the true value of his art. Well, I would be too if I could fetch $8.3 million. Right? If you're a fan of Pringles. You'll want to check this out. The next time you're rummaging around in your kitchen late at night, you'll be able to spot the can even in the dark. I think that's such a cool thing. The potato chip maker is getting in the Halloween spirit with new glow in the dark cans. The limited edition packaging comes in sour cream and onion. And yes, they had to do it. Original flavors. They are available in stores now while supplies last. That's a one-two punch for parties. That's like a glow yes. stick and a snack at the same time. <laughs> And if you're fortunate enough to be off on this Labor Day, why not curl up with a good book? That's because today is National Read a Book Day. And it falls each year on September 6th, so pick up a new book, read an old favorite, or listen to an audiobook as you get your other chores done. Besides helping reduce stress, reading also improves memory and concentration. And just one look outside, guys, will show you that this is definitely good reading weather. Oh, right yes. Now. Well, it, I after the show, though, I, we'll finish watching us and then pick up the book. With the rain, though, and how dark it is, picking up a book will make me go straight to sleep, though. Oh, <laughs> That's just me. Pop a melatonin and you're out yeah. cold. You've got some crazy right. vivid dreams, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's definitely, you know, been time to get inside this afternoon uh, when, in regards to the whole weekend. Until today's the day we had to run inside in the afternoon and now into the early evening with some areas of rain, of course, some lightning and thunder. But this is good for the aquifer. Now, we don't have any drought around our area, but it's nice to see the drought, the aquifer get a little bit of a boost and it should soon respond to the rainfall. You look at the zones of the aquifer and we like to get it within those purple lines, especially right there in northern Bear County. Uh, that's where we have part of the recharge zone and it's nice to get it right there in that sweet spot. And sure enough, we got some rain right in the sweet spot of the aquifer. So we like to see that. Here's a look at the rainfall estimates by the Doppler radar. And you see everywhere you have green, that's about one to two inches of rainfall estimated by the radar. So we have spotty areas of one to two inches, but some locations of even higher amounts, especially when you get into these yellow colors just south of Medina Lake. Unfortunately, that's outside the Medina Lake watershed, so that's not going to help drain into the lake, which is down quite a bit, but it's good for northern Medina County and points downstream from the Medina River there. Two and a half inches estimated by the Doppler radar, and you get into parts of San Antonio, especially near UTSA, about three inches of rain up I-10. You get to Fair Oaks Ranch, uh, Scenic Oaks area, about two to three inches, and then not quite as much around the, north, the far north side around 1604. Not really as much, just a few hundredths to maybe a quarter of an inch. And then you get to the south side, and unfortunately, not much there either. The outflow boundaries really didn't even kickstart any rain through parts of 410 and 1604 on the far south side. Now within 410 here, Alamo Heights, Monta Vista, Terrell Hills, uh, some decent accumulations, not bad for the lawn and garden. 1.8 inches there, parts of Alamo Heights, you get to Monta Vista, 1.1. That's between I-10 and 281. So it's nice to see some parts of town getting some decent rainfall. But that's what we have in terms of the rainfall estimates and obviously some nice accumulations of the hill country. This is what we have right now when it comes to the action on the radar screen. A lot of the heavy rain locally has turned into good soaking light rain, still with a little bit of lightning and thunder. I'll turn on the lightning here and we still have some lightning and thunder out there even within the lighter rain, but the heaviest downpours are popping up along this outflow boundary south of town, just outside of Pearsall, kind of north of Pleasanton and south of Pleasanton there and parts of LaSalle uh, County as well. We see a little bit of activity, but most of it is just this now good soaking rain that's slowly dissipating and gradually coming to an end. I mean, I'd like it to keep going, but it can't last all night. 100 for the high today. We officially did it. I know it looks like it's nighttime out there. It's just dark because of the clouds and the rain, 76 degrees. And we did finally actually measure some precipitation, by the way, at the airport, a few hundredths of an inch so far. Temperatures largely in the 70s. Pleasanton dropped to 85, 80 now in Divine, Hondo 74, Canyon Lake 78. It's a refreshing evening. Maybe take that book out in the porch. Right where you have a covered porch, ah, enjoy a little light rain, some cool temperatures. Yeah, but 
Different story, Catula, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, Carrizo Springs. We're talking 100 degrees there. This evening, though, the lingering showers through sunset, and then we'll see some partial clearing later on tonight, closer to 10 o'clock. Not much of a breeze out there, and temperatures making it, I think, into the lower 70s for most of us first thing tomorrow morning. Then upper 90s, right near 100 degrees for the high temperature. Not just tomorrow, the rest of the week, into the weekend, 100 give or take a few lower humidity though Wednesday through Saturday you'll notice a drop in the mugginess for the afternoons so Adam burgers hot dogs with a side of rain and lightning is what yes, we deal with today okay that's right. <laughs> all right thanks Adam <laughs> thanks Adam in case you missed it coming up next right now police investigating after at least one person shot and killed a man on the west side Gunshots rang out in the 2300 block of Culebra Road this morning. That's near North General McMullen Drive. According to officers, witnesses told them some sort of fight broke out. Then a vehicle pulled up. At least one person inside that vehicle pulled out a gun and started shooting. The victim was hit four times. Police say EMS tried to help him, but he died at the scene. The suspected shooter drove away before police even got to the scene. At this hour, police have not announced any arrested. Gonzalez County Sheriff Robert Eklon has died following a long battle against COVID-19. That's according to the Sheriff's Office. Sheriff Eklon was a Fredericksburg native who served as a state trooper with the Texas Department of Public Safety for 35 years. He then retired from TDPS and then ran for Gonzalez Sheriff last year in 2020 and took office in January of this year. Funeral arrangements are still pending. A stolen vehicle is found in flames and a San Antonio police officer is blown back after after it explodes. Crews with the San Antonio Fire Department were able to get the scene under control, but the flames left the vehicle destroyed, as you see there. Two air conditioners were found inside, which police believe may have been stolen. Police say suspects were also spotted leaving the area. However, officers have not released a description. Car dealership in Minnesota. Three car thieves come into the service center, steal five vehicles last weekend. They got away with it and felt good about themselves, and so they went back the next night with more guys and stole more vehicles. That last count, they've arrested one thief, recovered five of those stolen cars and trucks, so 12 are still out there somewhere along with several of the thieves.